Um, just moving on to the, the final talk in this session. So the second update from the Crime Surveys for England and Wales. This one from Joe Trainer. So Joe has, uh, has worked at ONS uh, for over 20 years. and that time, he's worked on a, a range of, of leading government surveys, including Labour Force Survey, General Household Survey, and, the cur and currently the Crime Survey for England and Wales. Uh, he's been responsible for the reduction dissemination of some of the UK's key labour market, economic and social indicators. And as head of the Crime Survey transformation, he is currently working on the transition of uh, the Crime Survey from a single interview survey conducted face-to-face -to, -face to a multimodal survey with respondents being interviewed annually over a number of years. And good luck speaking over that, Joe. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, yeah, just before I start, I was just thinking, I remember when the Crime Survey for England and Wales first um, moved to the Office for National Statistics. In fact, it was Mark Bangs and I who, who were working on the survey along with um, John Flatney. Uh, anyway, we were working in the London office and uh, the national statistician at the time was Jill Matheson, who, who used to head up the social survey division at the ONS before she became the national statistician. Anyway, I remember working late one evening, she said to me, she came across and she said, oh, Joe, I, I hear you've taken over uh, running the crime survey for England and Wales. So I said, yeah. And she said, just one word of advice, never change the methodology. <laughs> so here I find myself over 10 years later <laughs> delivering a presentation on changes to the approach to the crime survey for England and Wales. Uh, I never really asked her, why she said that. I think one of the main kind of, oh, I've got this, well, one of the main kinds of uh, considerations, which is what Kath just mentioned, is, is the timeline, of course, and, and the maintenance of a consistent time series with a consistent methodology behind it. And that is, that is extremely important and, and, and probably, I think, one of the main things that she was driving at. So it is with a lot of hesitation that you kind of consider changes to the approach and the methodology. Anyway, I might say a little bit more about that as, as we go through. Of course, there have been changes to the survey and the survey instrument over time, um, as Kath was saying. I think a big one, um, one of the major ones, was the introduction of self-completion interviewing for the, um, uh, for the modules on, on violence, domestic violence, um, and sexual assault and so on. Uh, uh, you know, a, a major change. Um, um, of course, but that didn't affect the key estimates because the key estimates were, were, were in a different section of the questionnaire and independent of that. And then there's been various changes to the sample size, but it's always been a random probability sample, always conducted in more or less the same way, using the postal address file and so on. Uh, and then we come on to um, the pandemic, um, which is an interesting point in time, really. Um, because we had to change the methodology. Um, you know, I, it, it was funny, when, when the pandemic struck uh, in the March and all face-to-face -face interviewing was suspended, then there was an immediate question, well, what's going to happen to crime over this period? And you go, well, well, the main measure that we have of crime, we can no longer conduct. So we were all scrambling around to see how, what we could do we were asked to do something in a very short period of time. So it was, it was, you know, I suppose the first thing you always do in a survey is struggle to look for a sample. And the only thing that we could use as a sample was people who'd previously agreed to take part on the crime survey, and we had their telephone numbers. So that's effectively what we did at, at that point in time. We took all those people who had agreed to take part on the survey over the previous two years where we had the telephone and we thought well we'll we'll interview those people the one issue with that sample was was it wasn't a, a very large sample and we wanted to get some very quick snapshots so what we thought well we'll introduce a panel design so we'll interview people at three monthly intervals the main reason for going back to people wasn't that we wanted to move to a panel design necessarily, but just to maintain the sample, because we were, we were going to run out of the sample very quickly. Anyway, we did that, and that was the, the approach we took. But we changed the methodology, and to some extent that's changed our thinking. 
going forward. Um, and then, of course, face-to-face -face interviewing um, was introduced again in October 2022. So I just want to say a little bit about the drivers, of the, the drivers for the change, the drivers that, to move to the kind of the, the things that sit behind this transformation programme and, and, and the way in which we're transforming it. Um, the first, of course, is the post-pandemic field operations. Kat's already mentioned a little bit about that. Also, changing policy requirements. What are those policy requirements that sit behind the survey and that kind of dictate the way it's run? And then, of course, modern technologies are also a driver. So, drivers for change to the face-to-face -face due to field operations. Well, the cost of face -to interview, face-to-face -face interviewing has increased substantially in recent years, and particularly post-pandemic. So there's a real financial consideration there about the cost of field operations. Face-to-face -face field work is considered the gold standard, but the costs associated with it are, are, are exorbitant. I think, the, and the main part of that cost is in relation to getting the interview in the first place. It's the amount of legwork that people do to go round to the houses to actually get the cooperation. The actual interview itself is not where the cost lies. The, the costs are always associated with actually getting the person to agree to participate. I think another thing that also has affected things over time is the, is the panel, the panel of interviewers that, that were uh, always had maintained our surveys. During the pandemic, of course, when face-to-face -face interviewing was suspended, and a lot of these people were all the people. I think they gave up being uh, a face-to-face -face interviewer on surveys, and, and, and I think the panel reduced significantly. So, and I do think that has affected things since we've gone back to face-to-face -face interview. And then, of course, societal factors leading to less willingness to take part. I think I think that, of course, is a driver. So, the response rates, um, as Kath mentioned pre-pandemic around 69-70% um, and they were consistently around that. We used to consistently get around between 70-75% to 75 over the last 10 years have now dropped to, to 42% and I, I just put the Labour Force survey figures up there as well because you can see that it's not just a crime survey for England and Wales, it, it, it's all government surveys that seem to be affected post-pandemic in relation to it. So, field operations. Policy initiatives, well, there's been a real drive for greater granularity, um, particularly as part of the UK levelling up agenda, um, which is really targeted policy at high crime areas. So th th there's a need for um, greater detail, which means a bigger sample size, or a, a larger number of interviews on which the estimates are based. And then there's t various targeted policies for subpopulations in relation to things like violence against women and girls. I'm, I'm not going to uh, cover that. I'm just covering the main survey changes here. And then I think one of the other things to say is that for a lot of surveys, the use of administrative data has, has seen the changing way which people regard social surveys. But I don't think that's the case for the crime survey for England and Wales. I think the Crime Survey for England and Wales was always set up as a kind of an alternative measure as against police recorded crime. And that its coverage is very different. Uh, okay, its coverage is limited and it, it does only cover the household population, that, that, that's very true. But what it also does is it covers those crimes not reported to or recorded by the police. And I think that continues to be the case. So when you think of the major administrative data source, you do see that it has its limitations and I think that's kind of like a, an important factor for the continuation of the crime survey. So what is the transformation programme? Well I think there's two pillars really in relation to it. One is the, an annual wave formation and that's for two reasons really. Um, 
because of all those field operations and so on. If you manage to get an interview with a person and you've put all that time and cost and effort into the person, it seems really strange that after the first interview you go, thank you very much, goodbye. There's, there's obviously a benefit to actually saying to that person, actually, would you take part in this survey again? There's a real cost benefit to, in order to do that. Um, and then the other side of it is a move towards, with new technologies, towards multimodal surveying. I think we were quite lucky in the transformation program in the, the tele the, 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 when, the cri when the pandemic hit, we moved to a telephone survey operation. So we, we quickly designed or translated, I think probably is a better word to say, the face-to-face the -face survey instrument to operate over the telephone. So that we, we realized that the, we, we could develop the survey instrument to, offer, to operate both face-to-face -face and via the telephone. The second part of the transformation program is to try to see whether we can make it operate fully multimodally. So that includes uh, online uh, and asking those survey questions um, not only in a kind of face-to-face -face way, not don't mean face-to-face, -face, but with an interviewer, but actually seeing whether we can do that and further reduce costs by moving to some kind of either multimodal or, or, or online survey. The, the real struggle with that side of things, of course, is getting inc incident estimation. It, it, it's, it's easier to ask people whether they've been a victim of different crime types. When you start to ask them how many times in the last year somebody has been a victim of each, and when you think about repeat victimization, uh, multiple victimizations and so on, there's a real complexity there. And actually, if you look at the crime survey instrument and the way in which it operates, if you look at the the face-to-face -face questionnaire, you see that there's, it relies on a real interaction between the respondent and the interviewer to actually negotiate those repeat, multi which, which are repeat, which are multiple incidents, which are series of incidents and so on. In order to do that in an online situation is very complex and that's where the real struggle is. We, we've been struggling this for a number of years and that's where the real, the real struggle uh, lies in relation to that part of the transformation program. Um, so, where have we got to? Well, the Wave 1 will continue to operate as a face to face survey, and that's one of the real central elements to this, and harps back to what I was saying about Jill Matheson. That part of the transformation program, we know we can move to a panel design and we know that we can maintain the same estimates in the same way because we are not really changing the, uh, the way in which the first interview takes place. Um, so following the first interview, subsequent interviews take place at intervals of one year for a further two to five years. Uh, we don't know how many years we would continue the panel. It, it, depends on response and various other things and uh, th there's a lot that sits behind that so I think, I think we, we have to look at how long we would want the panel to run for. There are advantages and disadvantages for those later waves. Um, so that I just a little bit more on the panel design. What we're doing at the moment is, is we're conducting um, wave one interviews in the home and then we're following up at wave two via the phone and we're just about to start wave three um, but there are other opportunities there Oppor opportunities which we haven't taken at the moment so we're concentrating if we're concentrating on that kind of like that middle line that middle section that that's what's going on but you could see how with further development follow up interviews for online self-completion modules uh, as, as an approach that could be taken and also that you could actually because it's a panel now that you could actually take 
some kind of ad hoc studies between waves. So there's real opportunities to move to a panel design, um, um, which we, we need to think about and we need to take forward at some point. But we're just concentrating on that middle band at the moment. So we went live in on the panel design. Yeah, we went live in October 2022. And so um, September 2023, we, we received the first year's data um, from the contractor. Um, we've processed that data. I will say something about the data. The first six months, the return to face-to-face -to -face interview in the year before, the return was quite slow, as you might imagine. So the first six months' data, we were kind of, you know, suffered from response rates and various other issues with it. So um, the way to data that follows on a year later, of course, that has a similar effect. So we, we've waited for a full year's worth of data before we could really start to interrogate it in terms of looking at the data and what's happening in terms of bias and attrition and all those various different aspects. We've just received the data, we received the data then, um, November time. Um, the work that we've done, it says the modal effects and bias, we've concentrated on the bias of course to begin with. Um, I think I can say that we've probably got our first iteration of a kind of a, a non-response bias weight at way two. So we've kind of modelled um, um, the kind of um, all the characteristics that are associated with victimisation at wave one and, and put them into the weighting for the for, for the for the for the second wave of interviews. Um, I think yeah, I, these are early days on this, these kinds of approaches and these kind of methodologies. Um, and we're looking at it, we've just, we're, we're on to a second revision already in relation to that. The one thing about the bias is though, I suppose, in relation to it, it's not like bias at wave one. The bias at wave two, at least you can, you know who the non-responders are between the two waves, so you can make some kind of modelled adjustment for it. You're not, you're not re reliant on census data, which is what we, we do at wave one. So, um, yeah, so kind of we're starting to do some work on that. And then, of course, there's going to be various uh, assessments of the data before we actually start to combine these data together uh, um, properly and produce uh, an estimate which will be different from the wave one on its own. It, it will have to be. It takes a different approach, different methodology. We need to do a lot more work in understanding that. On the multimodal survey, um, the progression, um, I mean, we started this a long time ago, um, really. It was pre-pandemic when we did the first uh, iteration with the contractor, Cantor at the time, who now called Verian. Um, so they did the first, I think probably the first two rounds of work in relation to this. We've since bring, brought it in-house um, where we have ONS methodologists now looking at it. There's a, there's a series of reports that have been done. Um, um, we, there's, there's three links to three papers there. Um, we've kind of, um, we took kind of a slightly different approach more recently, re-looking, it says a discovery report, but we, we've actually re-looked at what ourselves and other countries have done around moving online, particularly the NCBS uh, in America uh, and the approach that they t they've taken in relation to transforming their survey instrument um, um, for online capability. I will touch on one thing within that, and that is actually that there are also improvements to those screener questions that will make a difference to the estimates that the crime survey produces even at wave one. It's an interesting thing that if you think, look at the screener questions on the crime survey for England and Wales, 
There's the final question in the set is around threats and intimidation. When you actually look at those people who say yes to threats and intimidation, what you actually see is that a lot of it goes into the classification of violence without injury. So what they consider actually to be a threat is actually more akin to a common assault and, and gets coded as such uh, in the survey instrument. When we moved to the TCSEW during the pandemic, we were very concerned about harassment at the time, so we tweaked the threat question. Just, just tweaked it to in, change the wording to include harassment. And what we suddenly saw was a substantial increase in the estimates of violence without injury from the telephone, from the crime survey, because a lot more people were saying, yes, I've suffered harassment, but actually, when you actually look at what they describe, it actually comes out as, as, as common assault. So therefore, we are actually looking at the questions and the screener questions and who gets screened into, in, into this, in, into these things to see whether we can actually improve the estimate. Now, again, back to the Jill Matheson comment at the beginning, we have to be really cautious about how we do that and how we implement it and at what stage. We've not come close to even considering that and in terms of parallel runs and how that actually would be integrated and would operate. But all I would say to you as users is that we're, we're very mindful of it and, and we, need to, we know we need to give it for consideration. A little bit on wave two response rates. Um, um, you can see the wave one response rate there um, hovering around the 45% and then the, the wave two response rate. Not brilliant, somewhere around the 30% mark. Um, um, two different measures of it there. That's both at wave two. Um, wave two response rate around th around 30 odd percent for those who completed a wave one interview and around 50 percent of those that are actually issued at a sample those who agree to to take part um, I I am for time. all right 10 minutes okay <laughs> kind of uh, I must have rushed through it a little bit I'm usually I'm usually uh, I'm usually uh, quite quite slow but today I've gone a little bit quicker.